Okay, hi, um, I'm Alex. Um, I can't see you all, but um, I think we decided that if anybody does want to ask questions as I'm going through, that's absolutely fine. Um, but we will have a sort of question section at the end as well, um, after you've seen um, some of the data from, from you guys, from your, your data from LLM. Um, so, generally speaking, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about Salmonella, salmonellosis, the disease, and sort of what clinical signs you might see it causing um, in, in sort of your herd, if it doesn't affect your herd, or if you have got, um, you know, salmonella sort of um, found on some of these testing that's already gone on. Um, a little bit about how, how salmonella spreads, um, a little bit about prevention and control as well. And then I'll hand over some salmonella um, data that's collected from, from LLM farms on your bulk tank testing. And then, as I said, uh, some discussion, open discussion at the end, um, ask what you like um, all throughout as well. Um, so the disease, first of all, hopefully this isn't too science scene, you're probably mostly familiar with this, but salmonella is a bacteria, a rod-shaped bacteria. That's an electron microscope picture, so a blown up picture of the bacteria under a microscope. Um, so rod-shaped bacteria, um, and you will see as well, there's all these sort of bits on the outside, so they do have flagellum, which are basically like little tails to help them around. So why are we talking about it? Is it important? Well, I guess sort of my perspective on it is, yes, potentially it is important. And there's a sort of few reasons for that, really. Um, one of them, um, as well as the, the animal health side of things, is the um, zoonotic side of things. So it is one of these bugs that you probably well know can pass to people and can, in certain, cir certain circumstances, be pretty nasty. And I'll tell you sort of which salmonella that, that could be in a bit. Um, the other reason why it's potentially important is because it is around in the environment quite a lot. It, it, it does seem to be... Um, around a fair bit and possibly more than we think because these little critters are pretty sneaky so in essence they're very good at hiding from the immune system and part of this is the flagelli that i told you in the first picture the little tails which are supposed to be illustrated by this cape in this uh, bacteria here i did not put that illustration together myself um, but really, these, these little tails, for the jelly, capes, whatever you want to call them, um, they can drop off the bacteria um, and it means that they can't be detected um, within the animal so well. And also they hide in various different cells um, and really are pretty good at, at, at evading being seen by um, hosts that they're, they're, they're sitting inside. So it does mean that some animals can become carriers of the bacteria. So basically they, the bacteria can sit inside them and uh, not be detected or only intermittently be, be detected. So um, yeah, you might not necessarily always be aware that they are there. And that does have some implications for some of the testing that's carried out um, with salmonella. The other thing, uh, the other way it can be quite sneaky is it does survive, like I said, so it can survive within the animal um, in the carrier status, but also it can survive pretty well in the environment. So um, it's found to survive in water for weeks, up to a year in soil and at low and high temperatures. So it's pretty hard to completely get rid of it off, off any farm. Potentially possible, but you know, realistically, without amazing biosecurity, um, if it's on there, it, it, it is pretty hard to get rid of. Um, just to add to the complication, there are lots of different types of salmonella, but luckily, um, for cattle anyway, there are really probably three main different types that you need to be aware of. Um, but us vets, I certainly in practice sometimes got salmonella isolated with names I'd never even heard of. Luckily, um, as I said, there's three main ones in cattle and they're sort of categorised uh, sort of into different groups. Um, so how common is salmonella um, in, in cattle? Um, and unfortunately, we don't 100% know. So actually, some of the data that um, you've got from LLM is, uh, or what we presented to you, is pretty interesting because a lot of the information um, that we work on is actually Irish, Republic of Irish um, information, um, as opposed to um, UK um, sort of prevalence data showing how many herds are infected. So, um, yeah. At the current time, although um, one of the labs is hopefully going to produce something quite soon, there is no actual nationwide UK monitoring showing levels, like I said. Um, 
the best proxy really we've got um, is a relatively large scale study in Irish dairy farms. Um, and this showed that about 49% of those farms were positive. This is based on bulk milk testing like you've um, done, but they did then look at the impact of uh, what those tests um, had on, on the herd. So they did lots of data analysis, lots of looking at what other factors were going on on farm, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the test is no use for a vaccinating farm because if you're vaccinating, you should have antibodies and we're looking for antibodies in these tests. Um, but these were non-vaccinating dairy farms and not particularly ones that they thought were would have salmonella. So just a random assortment of farms, um, essentially like, like I think has been happening with you guys. Um, all the other data really that we have in the UK, other than individual practices um, doing things, um, are lab diagnosis from actual samples that have been sent off. So um, this probably requires, um, you know, the vet to think it might be salmonella and then they'll have to be told to check for that. Um, and probably a lot of the data was never submitted. So not every, you know, scouring calf will get sampled for salmonella by any stretch of the imagination. And in fact, on that, on that note, some of the, um, you know, calf side scour kits, so scour tests that we do on farm, for instance, um, will not test for salmonella so really the testing is relatively limited um you know has been limited until relatively recent times within the uk so um i'll move on from that sort of thing hopefully you get the gist but really i'll now dwell and give you a brief overview of the three um main types of salmonella that affect cattle in 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 the uk of the results that have come from the labs when it has been looked for the first one, Salmonella Dublin, which you might have heard of. The second one, Salmonella Typhimurium, which some of you might have heard of. And the third one, Salmonella Mimbadaca, which you may not have heard of. Um, and that is the third most common. So um, if you've had it, you've probably heard of it, but it is a bit of a weird, funny name. Um, so yeah, and they're the main three. And this um, chart here, um, hopefully sort of indicates sort of the relative um, importance of these three types. So obviously Dublin is the most common um, and, you know, really accounts for pretty much two thirds of, of the salmonellas that um, are isolated. That was um, the, the most recent data and um, I had when I wrote this um, was in 2018. I think we've got the 2019 data just through now. Um, but pretty much it's very similar year on year, really. Um, but yeah, Dublin in the red section here uh, accounts for about two thirds of the salmonellas, typhimurium, 13%, and then the Madanka, 7.1%. Um, so really you can see these three account for, well, well over 80% of um, salmonellas um, that are isolated when they are isolated. So we'd assume that this is, you know, probably, you know, the trend. Um, over the entire country. So Salmonella Dublin, first of all, let's talk a little bit more of that. Um, so we said it's the most common sort of Salmonella. Um, it affects both calves and adult cattle. So it can affect either, it doesn't really um, have a preference for affecting one or the other. Some farms you might see it more in one, uh, you know, young stock, some, some farms you might see it more in adults, but really all the information that's out there says that it can affect either. I'd say one of the most important things about Ensalmonella Dublin is that you do get um, relatively commonly, there's no great data on this either, that probably up to about 10% of the animals that have become infected and um, becoming latent. And that means they're potentially persistent carriers when they get stressed um, through various things, disease, poor nutrition, calving movements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they potentially can shed the bacteria. Um, so that's quite important to, to sort of remember that it's sort of sitting in the background potentially in, in a portion of your, of your herd. Um, it's shed predominantly in feces, there's some, um, some evidence that it can also be shed in milk as well, but often sort of muck contaminated milk is, is even higher risk. Uh, but yeah, feces and, and to a smaller extent milk. Um, classically, it's um, the salmonella that's associated with abortions. If you get abortion due to salmonella, it's likely to be Dublin, but not definitely. 
Um, but also, and I will highlight this further on, so there's lots of other clinical signs associated with it as well. Um, so classically, I think that sort of vets and, and probably farmers think potentially scour, uh, diarrhea and abortion. But I just want to highlight sort of the vast array of other signs as well that it could be associated with. Um, it's not commonly affecting humans, uh, but it can, like all salmonella can. And if it does, it can be really nasty and, and is potentially fatal to blood um, if, if it does um, affect humans. I also should mention, and I haven't said this so far, but as a disclaimer, I do work for the company. We do make a salmonella vaccine called Bombivac S, so I'll, <laughs> I don't get commission. I don't work on the sales front. I work purely on the technical side. Um, but just to sort of highlight that um, salmonella dumma, which is the most common salmonella, is um, you know covered by a vaccine that's out there. Um, the second um, most common sort of salmonella, like I said, is typhimurium. Um, probably more frequently seen in cars, but again, not exclusively. Um, and it can cause classically sort of scarring cars, but again, lots of other different signs can be associated with it. Less likely to cause carrier animals, um, but possible. Um, and um, it's, as it's not a non, uh, isn't a cattle specific um, bacteria quite so much as Dublin, it is more likely um, to be the one that affects humans. So, so watch out particularly if it is on your farm. And again, um, you can get a vaccine against typhimurium. The third most common, possibly the most interesting, because it's a little bit um, different in my eyes, um, is this Mubandaka which um, predominantly seems to affect adults but it is possible to affect calves and it's probably you'll see why it potentially affects adults more in a second. Um, it typically sort of uh, causes diarrhea but also temperatures um, generally being off colour. Um, so yeah again um, you know a mix of signs really don't just necessarily think diarrhea. Certainly um, with any um, salmonella, but particularly this one, it does seem that immunocompromised animals, so animals are sick for some other reason, uh, might uh, be more likely to get the bandaka. And it has been sometimes shown that actually they can get a, 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 a Dublin or a type of murium infection plus some bandaka infection. So they may be suffering from, from one of the others and then the bandaka can uh, rear its ugly head and affect them as well. Luckily on this one, um, it's not thought that these animals can become carriers. So that's a good positive thing, actually, um, because if you can get rid of it, then uh, hopefully um, there won't be animals um, within the herd that are rumbling on um, having a problem with it. It's pretty rare in humans, but I did read an article, um, it was a state article, that um, actually it had been isolated in humans and was associated with Kellogg's cornflakes. So um, yeah, it is possible. Um, but that you know, sort of um, type of is the most um, probable. And yeah, the, the funny thing with this one is that it does seem to be associated with um, you know, certain feeds, so feed origin, so processed feed um, predominantly um, on various ones. So um, I think soya, rapeseed, um, I've got a few others, maize meal, palm kernel, so various, you know, sort of um, concentrate feeds it has been associated with so usually by removing the contaminated feed source um, you will get rid of the problem um, and I should highlight that it isn't covered by the Bombivac S vaccine there are potentially other um, vaccines that can get specifically made um, for your farm for this one if you do have an ongoing issue but usually as I said sorting the feed out um, will sort the issue out um, you know sort of in the long term anyway. So I've said quite a bit of this already, but I'll be a bit more specific for this wide range of clinical signs you might see. So obviously diarrhea and dysentery, like really nasty diarrhea when they're shedding the gut lining um, is, is possible. Um, but really just to point out, you can get this sort of acute, so sudden onset diarrhea, you know, classic diarrhea, but also these sort of like more long-term rumbling diarrhea. So they're just a bit loose, you know, you maybe think they're acidotic, that sort of thing. Um, so just bear that in mind, really, and that it's not necessarily kind of a hose pipe nasty diarrhea. Um, blood poisoning or septicemia, so, you know, off colour, sick, high temperatures, young calves, you can't quite, you know, put your finger on, certainly possible to be salmonella. 
It's been isolated from joint infections. It's certainly not the only cause of joint infections, um, but certainly if you, you can't get on top of them um, and there's other signs going on, it, it certainly could be implicated. Um, and I certainly in practice retrospectively think probably um, uh, an abscess within the spine. This is supposed to be a picture of the spine over the right hand side here with a, a big fat abscess here. Um, I think that abscesses in calves um, was potentially a, a sign of, of salmonella in calves. Um, and I didn't put two and two together necessarily at the time, but retrospectively, I think that, you know, it certainly is a high likelihood that um, post-mortem finding this was, was maybe indicating um, that there was, the, there was salmonella going on, which was subsequently um, isolated elsewhere. Pneumonia. Now, I think this is a real biggie for me anyway. Um, Certainly some of the labs um, have associated pneumonia quite sort of strongly um, with salmonella and we certainly probably don't have it on our radar for, um, you know, sort of young stock uh, calf pneumonias and probably lots of the viral diseases or, you know, um, a few of the bacteria as well, I guess, sort of mycoplasma and things like that. Um, but certainly salmonella is a bug that can contribute to pneumonias and can be a key cause of them. Um, and the SEC lab in Scotland certainly have done quite a bit of research on that um, in the last couple of years. Um, and also for me, I think in practice, um, I've um, found it sometimes hard to differentiate a salmonella rear rink of your head from, from an IVR, especially in unvaccinated herds or herds that you sort of think have got rumbling IVR infections. So certainly worth bearing in mind for both sort of young stock and adult pneumonias that sort of haven't got under control, but there are lots of, you know, you, you, you've done other things to try and try and rectify the situation. Abortion, like we've said, usually sort of um, mid to late gestation abortions, so sort of five to seven months commonly. Has been associated with a reduced milk production, and I'll come to that in a, in a bit, and potentially a slight increase in cell counts as well. Um, obviously, you know, animals that have had um, salmonella, um, be it sort of a bad bout or, or just a rumbling thing that you've never quite put your finger on, are likely to have you know, poor growth. So certainly sort of reduced growth in calves and you can't find anything else, it's certainly worth, worth um, you know, bearing salmonella in mind. Um, this is quite an interesting one, dry gangrene. Um, so this can basically manifest itself as either the ear tips of calves falling off, um, as this is supposed to be a calf head with uh, ears that have fallen off, or potentially kind of extremities like bottle, bottom of the limbs getting wounds that won't heal. Um, and this is associated with sort of the inflammation that the bug can cause and it can really essentially block off the blood supply um, by the inflammation to some of these extremities and, and cause them either to not heal very well or for even, you know, in severe cases for ear tips to drop off. And certainly I've been reported down south anyway that that ear tips falling off has been the predominant sign in a cough um, housing that haven't figured out anything else um, and they subsequently isolated salmonella. So of a weird one but quite interesting. Obviously death is a possible implication um, and here are just a few reminder pictures really. Top one here looks like it could be a wound caught on something but this sort of thing if you're getting lots of these could indicate this a sort of dyed, dry, dry gangrene associated with salmonella. Certainly not going to be the case in, in, all, in, all, um, in all things that look like this but just sort of worth bearing in mind. Just a reminder about abortions and also um, this isn't a particularly brilliant picture but um, just a reminder of those sort of long-term ill 50 ones hopefully you've got rid of those sort of things but maybe long-term ill 50 ones that you think are maybe a yoni's case or a flute case or something like that just bear in mind um, salmon can you know sort of have have effects on those and um, you know longer term effects as well as those sort of sudden onset abortion diarrhea kind of things any questions so far? I should probably pause for a tick. Um, can't say anything in the chat. I can't really see the chat though. No, there's nothing on the chat so far, but I am keeping an eye on it if people do um, want to write anything down. Cool, right. I'll, um, I'll crack on, but yeah, shout out if there are any. So um, I've mentioned that it is a zoonosis, so salmonella can pass to humans, particularly type of murium. Um, just to highlight, this is sort of, it, it looks quite horrific, this slide. And I think sometimes it makes farmers think, oh gosh, I don't want anything to do with salmonella, it's going to be a problem. Um, 
but just to highlight, it is a reportable disease, which basically means if the bug itself is isolated, um, then the APHA and the ministry do want to know what type it is just for human health side of things. And um, you shouldn't, if you've got a positive isolation of the actual bug, um, then you shouldn't be, um, you know, selling raw milk, essentially. Um, but just to highlight that all the testing your vets have been doing is looking for antibodies. So it's not looking for the actual bug. It's looking for exposure to the bug that might have been it might not still be actively happening. It's, it's usually been happening in the last sort of four to five months on average. Uh, but essentially looking for antibodies doesn't create all, any of these issues. So in essence, um, you might be better doing something when you know that you've got salmonella on farm from like a bulk milk antibody test, but actually it hasn't reared its ugly head badly enough for you suddenly to be getting lots of, you know, culture positives and lots of isolations and then, you know, the consequential sort of, I guess, follow up that, that happens. So um, just to highlight the fact that it is something that the ministry do get involved in, but just kind of with regards to, yeah, the testing you're doing so far, no issues with that. And this is purely for sort of, um, you know, increased knowledge as to, to what's going on on, on your units. Um, the other sort of side of things I've sort of alluded to a little bit is sort of the economic consequences of having salmonella on your farm. And the main info we've got on this um, is from Ireland. So this was from uh, a study that did very similar to what you guys had done, um, LLM had done, and, and looked at um, sort of bulk milk um, positives. So they found antibodies, so they've seen um, the herds, the dairy herds have been exposed to the virus. Um, they weren't, as I said, herds that thought that they had a problem with salmonella or really thought they had a specific problem. Um, but then they delved down into the data and actually looked compared to sort of herds that um, don't have a salmonella um, problem and don't on, on positive on bulk tanks. Um, and compared to vaccinated herds as well, actually, which I'll come to in a second, the, the, the cost um, of having salmonella circulating. And provides that this has been translated from euros to pounds, um, but the approximate figure per cow, per dairy cow per year on these herds was about £100 a cow um, in losses based on the fact that, um, you know, they had um, a bulk milk positive. Uh, we don't really know the cost of beef herds, um, but it is in beef herds um, to a possible lesser extent, but maybe we're just not looking as much. Um, but if any of you have got beef, beef herds, well, I don't really know the costs at the moment to those, but we'd assume it'd be somewhere similar. So the costs really are broken down into sort of um, reduced milk. So it has been shown um, in one study anyway, about 316 kilo less milk per cow per year if you're salmonella positive. Um, and also just going down to the, the, the bottom of the page, um, there is some more data showing that um, herds that are salmonella positive on bulk milk and um, aren't vaccinating um, have a 6% lower milk yield compared to either a herd that, an equivalent herd, um, that are negative or are vaccinated when you take out all other factors such as you know bbd status nutrition this that and the other so that is statistically um you know derived so um, um and it's got nothing to do with msd who make the vaccine it's completely independent study um but that just sort of gives you some sort of indication as, as to what having salmon only heard could um you know be doing the other sort of data that we've got is uh, on average positive herds produced 3% um, fewer calves per pack per, per cow per year. We had a 1.5% greater calf mortality rate and on average uh, 20,000 uh, higher somatic cell count. So that gives you some indication as to sort of what the implications might be in, of, of having salmonella on your farm. Um, Alex, just a second. Um, we've got a question about uh, what about co-grazing with free-range hens? Um, oh, interesting. I'm sure you'll you'll touch on that in a minute. But there's also what if the chickens themselves are vaccinated against salmonella? Oh goodness, this is going to be really interesting. <laughs> um, can I do come to that in a little bit on biosecurity and other things? So can I 
part of that question, but remind me about it later, and I'll also think about the second part of it. <laughs> as well, we go we've got, on. We've got, sorry, we've got them coming in thick and fast now. There's oh, one gosh, and right. Also, what, uh, is there any connection between Salmonella and Bactoscan? Um, I don't know if, I, if anybody wants to ask that more specifically. Uh, I have, oh, sorry, I'm back scan, yeah. Um, I haven't seen any literature suggest that. I don't know about any of you other vets. That is cell count, but not back to scan. I haven't seen anything. Arguably, you think it could potentially in an acute outbreak situation, but I would it have to... Across that Irish study was just looking at basically um, herd performance records. I don't know whether they'll have gone into, you know, uh, my, you know, details like back scan. I don't think they did. I'm pretty sure they didn't. They looked I, I don't think there was anything in that study. I'm fairly sure. But I just, I don't know if there's anything elsewhere if you look at back to scan and thinking of the type of bacteria. And I think we've had to get back to you. Really good question. Nobody has asked me that before. So really good one. But we don't know, I think, is the answer so far, I'm afraid. But really good question. I think most of it, and maybe you vets can tell me, I, I think pretty much everybody here will be dairy, but I did just put a very quick beef slide in just in case we've got any calf ears or anybody that's got beef as well. Um, just to really say that um, sort of, this is the number in the dairy side of things about how many diagnoses of salmonella we've had um, in the UK over the last five years. So the vast majority in dairy, and I'd say there's probably vast amounts of, less data that isn't diagnosed and these won't include data such as you so this is just purely things that samples that arrive in the lab like muck samples or post-mortem samples and things like that it won't include you know milk antibody testing so it gives you an idea as to how many there are um, and that will be massively less than the number of cases there really are um, but the vast majority are in, in dairy um, there are some um, in beef but again probably because we can't put milk test and uh, therefore sort of be alerted to the fact it might be on farm we probably are um, looking less in in beef um, the the rest of the percentages will likely be sort of half rearers uh, and various other uh, sort of uh, enterprises but you can see the vast majority of dairy but we do think that there is an issue in the beef sector um, but we're not um, necessarily um, looking so much so how do you know if someone else is causing a problem so obviously sort of uh, there's a couple of problems to this. So if you're having a clinical outbreak, so you're suspicious, you're you know, getting any of the signs that we've said before in high numbers and classically, you know, as I said, diarrhea and abortions, um, you know, likelihood is you're either going to diagnose it on post-mortem, your vet, or um, in faeces. There are a few problems with that, though. Obviously, you're, you're kind of getting things uh, quite late on. There'll be significant losses already by this stage. And also, you don't necessarily always find it in these scenarios because it is a bacteria. It is responsive to antibiotics. Not every antibiotic, not all the time, there is some resistance. But often, these animals, certainly calves, by the time they've got to post-mortem, they've had loads of antibiotics in them. So actually, it sometimes is very, very difficult to actually always um, you know, decide um, whether it, it has been salmonella or not. And you certainly do get um, some some false um, negatives. There are some things that your vet can do. You know, there's various um, sort of certain samples that you might be more likely to to find uh, a positive with, but certainly um, you can, you know, sometimes not find it even if it has been the cause, and um, because it is a bacteria, and particularly if you have been using antibiotics. The other thing to bear in mind is that in muck, it's not shed all the time. It can be intermittently shed, so you've kind of got to get the right animal at the right time uh, to make sure you get positive. So um, I guess sort of, um, you know, from monitoring perspective and surveillance, so sort of to be one step ahead of the game, so to speak, um, it is likely in the dairy sector anyway, um, that you might be looking for a bull mill testing, like we've said before, and like you guys have been doing. Um, but blood sampling might also potentially be helpful, um, especially in young stock, although, um, I'll allude to this in a, in, in a bit. You can get uh, antibodies uh, through the colostrum uh, from uh, dams that can show up positive up to about three months of age. So that has to take some interpretation. So really, um, 
kind of need to work with your vet to figure out um, you know, the best way for your farm and how significant some of these results um, potentially are. And if you haven't found any um, salmonella, but you know, they are suspicious, you've eliminated other things, uh, or you want to check up sort of how significant some of these results are, then it's definitely worth sort of discussing you know, with, with your vet. The other thing just to bear in mind, and I'm sure you know, we'll talk about this when we look at your results, is that um, uh, certainly it is when we're looking for antibodies, you can get false negatives with this as well. Um, purely because uh, the sort of sensitive, the specificity of the test is good. So basically you're unlikely to, to, to get false positives, but um, false negatives are possible. Really, uh, because of the carrier animal status to some extent, so you might have animals that are actually positive, but they're not stressed and they're doing okay and the bug's hiding away, the body's not producing antibodies to it. And really until those animals become stressed um, or you know, something changes on farm, you, know, you might not see it. So you can get fluctuations in these as well. So generally speaking, looking uh, at uh, sampling uh, on multiple occasions can give you a clearer picture of what's happening. Um, there are some other reasons for, for getting the negative, but really I'm sort of trying to highlight here. I think um, that I think when we look at some of the results, you might see some fluctuations. You might have seen some fluctuations in some of your results. And there are lots of reasons for that happening. But uh, yeah, really just to highlight, if you get a single negative um, for antibodies, it, it, for any test really, it doesn't necessarily mean you're definitely free of the disease. And um, certainly you kind of have to look at trends of results rather than individual ones um, to, to get the best information as to sort of how severe things are affecting on your farm. So yeah, to summarize really, you're likely to get false positives, um, but false negatives are common uh, on both sort of muck samples, post-mortem samples, and muck sampling as well, and bloods, all, all everything you can potentially get false negatives. So it's hard to isolate sometimes. So um, prevention and control. Um, so the mainstay of this, um, you know, as I've talked about before, of transmission is um, feco oral spread. So sort of muck in mouth, essentially. So very similar to lots of other diseases, particularly yonis, um, and lots of the biosecurity measures and measures you might help to control this disease are similar to some of those other diseases. So hopefully you're familiar with some of them. But if you can remember one thing about salmonella, I think this is probably the side, sort of muck in mouth disease. So um, because of that, um, there's huge amounts of methods that salmonella can be transmitted. And this sort of is starting to go onto some of the questions I think you had for you, Rebecca. So one animal that's a carrier coming onto the farm can potentially shed millions of bugs and potentially infect a large number of animals that necessarily weren't, weren't necessarily infected on your farm. So lots of bacteria can be shed, um, replacement stock, you know, new stock coming onto farm, flying herds particularly, lots of sort of throughput, um, it, it can be a constant sort of, you know, threat really. Um, other methods that might produce muck, might result in muck on the farm as well, farm visitors, um, you know, animals, birds, vehicles, equipment, various things as well. So one thing I probably should mention here, which I think probably has some degree of relevance to the chicken and the bird thing. So the vast majority of cattle salmonellas are Dublin, like we said, which is type D salmonella. Now, we've said that is pretty cattle specific. So it's possible for some of the other um, animals to have it, but uh, if it's a Dublin that you found on your farm, it's unlikely um, that, um, you know, it, it's um, caused by, you know, wildlife or bird life, et cetera, et cetera. It's a type of murin possibly or a bandaka, but even so, um, you know, it, it's, it's not impossible, but it, it's certainly with Dublin anyway, the vast majority of, of, of salmonellas in cattle, um, you know, sort of are spread from from cattle to cattle, cattle muck to to, to um, other you know other cattle basically. Just say that question again, Becca, about the about the chicken vaccine. Um, so 
the question is, what's the risk of co-grazing with free range hens, hens are vaccinated against Salmonella T and E? My personal take on this, and I'm happy for other vet input, is that it would not be my main focus and concern, um, but it isn't an impossibility. You'd have to probably isolate the type of salmonella on your farm if you could to be 100% you know, convinced, but I, I probably would say unlikely. Do you guys have any other input, any of you other vets? <laughs> Um, I've just had a quick read of the, the data sheets for the, the um, chicken salmonella vaccines and it does look like they aim to reduce shedding of salmonella as well as um, reducing the risk to those chickens of becoming infected in the first place. But I, I do agree with Alex that unless you've specifically got a, um, a typhimurium salmonella, it, it, which so, um, Alex showed those slides, it's probably only 15% of UK salmonellas that are, that are type of murine. Unless just that's your issue, um, you're probably better off looking at this, this cow to calf, fecal oral um, spread as, as your main risk factor. Yep. Right, I'll carry on. So yeah, animal to animal, we've kind of covered that. So the animal to animal risk. So just bear in mind all the other things that you would do with normal biosecurity, um, you know, neighbouring herds, like relatively close contact certainly um, has been, in, you know, shown to, shown to cause it. Animals grazing away, you know, going to march shows, you know, hiring bulls, buying bulls in, et cetera, et cetera. Slurry management is probably quite important. Uh, I guess like it is with Yoni's disease. Because uh, we know that it can, um, you know, the bug can survive in slurry, and certainly um, if animals are grazing uh, sort of uh, land where slurry has been spread from infected animals, then certainly you could contract it that way. And water sources as well can survive in water. So, so if you've got a neighbouring farm that's got it, and you're showing the same water course, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, it can be important. So, um, really. I'm sure you vets can go through this, um, you know, on an individual farm basis, but I'll just briefly run through some of the, the points where if you have established from, from serial sampling that you're highly likely to be free from salmonella, you know, how you might be able to manage the situation. So ideally, you know, maintain your herd closed if you can do. Uh, source stock from a, a, a herd you think is free um, as best you can. Um, ideally, quarantine those animals um, if, 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 if at all possible um, when, before you introduce them to the herd. Think about, you know, sort of how uh, it might be brought onto the farm and, and, and keep good biosecurity. So avoid sharing equipment, balls, you know, thinking about communal grazing areas where potentially your herd might pick things up. Uh, maintain good fencing to make sure that they've not got fecal contact with your neighbours. Good carving box hygiene, so if you do inter inadvertently get it onto your farm, you're not going to be uh, infecting the, the next generation. And by far and away, the majority of, um, of, of, of breakdowns have been shown to be uh, where you've got um, you know, build up within carving box. So it's often a problem around carving. Um, animals are stressed dams are stressed, they're most likely to be shedding the bug when they're stressed, calves are, you know, sort of naive, they'll pick things up quite easily, um, etc, etc. Um, you know, think about sort of uh, vermin control, make sure potentially, as we said, it, it's maybe not the biggest um, scenario, but it is possibility, so basically don't let your um, feed sources get um, contaminated. Think about using pipe water if you can rather than mains because mains water won't be contaminated. Clean and disinfect, certainly between sort of, um, you know, cows and calves, but also on and off the farm. And I think quite key, investigate. So if you think you're free, uh, but, you know, you've got a suspicion that something might be happening or you've got something untoward happening on your farm, like abortions or scour, then sort of nip it in the bud and try and find out what it is sooner rather than later. And that will help sort of, you know, generally in, in all diseases, really. It's possible to vaccinate if you're free. Uh, it certainly might help keep you free and help you have an acute outbreak situation. Um, but, um, you know, as I said, 
all the other measures are, are very, very important. And if you can't do any of those, then uh, vaccination certainly is an option. If you're infected with salmonella, probably, I think all of your vets would agree as well, vaccination is probably the most feasible, um, you know, and practical practical option but I would strongly advise that you do that alongside some of the other measures uh, because um, potentially there's huge disease pressure here on these animals and um, you know the vaccine is good but you do need to help it along to make sure it does the best job that it can do. So really you do need a strict biosecurity plan the sort of things that I've already said before Think strongly about isolating sick animals hopefully you've got um, isolation boxes but if you have got acute cases they are going to be the ones that are going most likely to be shedding the bug um, so yeah make sure that they don't pass it on um, make sure you're sort of doing a, a, a good disinfection process particularly carbs but all parts of the farm just think about um, how things could be spread and um, it is easily spread um, you know on, on the farm like we said um, a little bit isolating on sick animals but segregate and treat clinical cases so basically um, you know, have, have a dedicated dairy for sick animals. Good carbon box hygiene, again, is key for the reason that I've said before. Um, we want to protect um, the next generation and we do know that animals are likely to be showing the bug, you know, around carving when they're stressed. Uh, don't feed sick um, milk from sick animals to calves. Hopefully you're not doing that anyway, but certainly um, if you know you've got salmonella on farm, um, you know, that is a sure way to, to get calves infected. And um, we said about slurry as well. So think about slurry management. Think about, you know, your own personal hygiene and uh, make sure you don't get, you know, the disease. Farm workers don't get the disease. And also you're not spreading it, um, you know, around all your animals. Uh, just bear in mind unpasteurized milk. Uh, if you are infected, um, it is probably advisable not to consume it, certainly in an acute outbreak situation. Um, and, you know, particularly think about immunocompromised people. So very old people, very young people, and just be aware that they might be more susceptible. They might be more likely to be the ones that, um, if you have got it on your farm, uh, might end up um, poorly with it. So a wee bit to finish off from me, um, a little bit about um, the vaccine. Um, if you are infected um, and you are um, using some of those other measures as well, um, you know, vaccination really, can help the situation uh, stop it spiraling out of control. Um, it should, as I said, be used in conjunction with um, good biosecurity and hygiene. And um, we have got some uh, quite nice risk assessments. And um, if anybody's interested, it, you can provide your bets with to make sure that you are doing that sort of um, in conjunction with vaccination or to sort of highlight where the problem areas are. Uh, Bobivac S is the only licensed vaccine out there um, and it basically can cover, like I've said before, against hypermurium in Dublin. So in essence, um, on this graph here, it covers all of those, uh, that amount of, of, of salmonella that we think is out there in the UK. So, you know, the vast majority of salmonellas will be covered by the vaccine. And in essence, uh, the vaccine sort of helps to protect against infections in the vaccinated animals um, but it also um, is uh, produces protection in cards via the colostrum um, so you know you've got a, a bit of a double whammy effect there as well and like we said it's particularly important because um, it can help to um, reduce um, shedding of animals and um, the vaccination um, so that will therefore help reduce shedding around the time when calves are being born when um, you know we really want Want that to be to be uh, to be um, you know sort of there to, to reduce the pressure on on the next generation really. So um, it also can help uh, sort of reduce infections in an outbreak situation. So reduce the severity of infections if you are in an outbreak situation rather than uh, you just know that it's on farm and rumbling in the background. Uh, and it also, like I said, helps to reduce shedding. So not only does it help the animals' immunity, but also sort of helps to reduce the amount of bugs in the environment, which then will have the knock-on effect of uh, reducing sort of contamination ongoing and hopefully just generally reduce the disease pressure on farm. Um, just quickly, Alex, sorry, we've got a, a few, oh. oh, loads of questions sorry. coming in. Um, so we've got one about price of vaccine. Um, I think as Alex has said, 
vaccine isn't necessarily a silver bullet. It's not going to fix everything. Um, so definitely worth chatting with the vets as to how it fits into your scheme, like into your farm. Um, and then obviously price varies a little bit between regions. So contact your, your own farm vet. Um, then we've got, if a carrier animal is vaccinated, will it reduce in shedding? It, yeah, that is the aim of the vaccination to reduce shedding of those carriers. It won't stop an animal being, if an animal is a carrier, it will remain a carrier for life, uh, but it should reduce the amount of shedding that that animal does when, you know, stressed, basically. Um, and lastly, we've got an interesting one on, so if you're pasteurising milk, will the protection from the mother be lost? By milk, do you mean colostrum? I'm going to guess yes. Yeah. So if you're pasteurising colostrum, will the protection from the antibodies be lost? Uh, ooh, that's a really good question. Um, so pasteurising colostrum, uh, you know, as with... Um, for all the whole host of antibodies that's contained within colostrum, we've got to treat um, colostrum a little differently to pasteurizing whole milk. So um, you, you, your vet's probably spoken to you about it, but this idea of colostrum, we, we pasteurize it sort of low and slow. So it's about six degree, 60 degrees for about an hour. We need to, to do colostrum. Whereas I think for um, pasteurizing whole milk, we go to a higher temperature for a shorter time. So we've got to hold colostrum at a high temperature, or sorry, at a low temperature, hot, low temperature for a long period. And that's to make sure we don't um, basically break up the antibody proteins that are in it and we don't want to damage them. So as, as long as you're pasteurizing your colostrum appropriately, no real issues. Yeah, I don't think it's different for salmonella antibodies as opposed to any others, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Any more? <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'll do my quick summary and then we'll see if we've got any more. So in conclusion from my part, and I'm happy to answer any other specific vaccine sort of questions, uh, but I haven't dwelt on that too much. Um, really, Sam, I really want to highlight that salmonella can cause many different problems. So don't just think, you know, diarrhea and abortions, really. Um, it might be causing problems rumbling underneath the surface, so not really blatantly obvious ones. Um, and certainly, I don't know, my thought was as we're getting look, sort of better at controlling other diseases like BVD that maybe we sort of blamed for a lot of things before, possibly sort of the, the, the other diseases that were also rumbling on in the background might become a little bit more evident. Um, so it's just worth really bearing in mind, um, not the obvious signs, but also sort of, is there something rumbling on the background that you can't quite pinpoint? Haven't things have improved, but not quite as nice as you wanted to really just remember that it can pose a risk to human health, so it is zoonotic. Uh, salmonella and Dublin and Typhimura are the most common and there is a vaccine against those. Uh, it uh, really does need to be a combination of vaccination and biosecurity and hygiene. Um, it's super important to do everything in combination. Um, and yeah, just really, if you have found it on your farm, speak to your vets, um, they can sort of, you know, do some risk assessments, look at your farm specific circumstances and really figure out sort of the best way forward. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the main state of things for me. So um, I guess um, any other questions that are sitting there, I'm happy to take, or we can go on to the next bit um, and present your data. Well, thanks, Alex. Um, there's still a couple of questions coming in. Uh, there's one about, is there any empirical evidence about antibiotic choice for controlling clinical disease? I think that will probably, again, that will probably develop, chain will vary between bets. Yeah, there is. It's quite interesting. So there is some evidence out there. It's a bit sketchy. Um, I'm not going to talk about antibiotic choice because I don't think it's my place, but um, there is in, in, in human medicine, certainly, um, it's been found that potentially increase, um, using uh, antibiotics um, in salmonella might increase the risk of carrier status. So it's kind of a weird, interesting one um, as to, I guess, 
if you're, you know, you're obviously going to potentially use them if you found a, a clinical case, but I guess you don't want to just rely on antibiotics because of resistance issues as well, but also because actually it might not help your long-term herd status with salmonella. I'd, I'd add as well, when we come to antibiotic choice, if, if we've got clinical cases, that would sort of imply that at some point on that farm, if we know it's salmonella, at some point we're going to have cultured salmonella. And whenever we do culture for salmonella, we get antibiotic sensitivity um, results back as well. So that will tell you in terms of what particular bugs, strains, whatever you've got on that on your farm, what antibiotics uh, options you've got open to you. And then, you know, your, your vet will go from there and advise you on what they think is most um, suitable. Cool. Does anybody have any other questions before we move on to the next bit? Um, Alex, I think that was great. Great summary. There's a few comments just saying how it was quite helpful and informative. So hopefully our little bit can be just as useful. Right, yeah, and I'm happy, I'll, I'll hang around, so I'm happy to chip in if there's anything else at the end. So, cool. Real. Oh, I've got to, actually, I've got, I've got the control, haven't I? So yeah. um, <laughs> I, I'll, do the, I'll do the thing that they do with the COVID presentation, so feel free to say next slide, please, whenever you need it. <laughs> cool, so we're going to hand over to Rob to go through some of the Whitchurch data first. Um, it's just brief, but hopefully it'll give you a bit of a, insight into so the quarterly um, infectious disease checks that we do on the bulk milk so msd the company that alex works for are uh, one of the companies that help fund that um, so hopefully we can make some use of it yep so we've obviously been doing these um for with the bvd ibr lepto fluke for i think four or five years now and then um, we've been doing quarterly salmonella antibody testing since um, the tail end of 2019. And we do um, sort of uh, sporadically sit down and look at these results, not just um, for each farm, which we, we look at them quarterly, um, in, in which case we get, get a report out to all our farmers. But we also look at the trends over, across the whole um, practice. So. In terms of Whitchurch, we expected um, that we'd see uh, a bit of seasonality. So um, in terms of salmonella being diagnosed across the UK, we get sort of a peak of um, a peak of diagnose, diagnoses in, in autumn, um, sort of peaking around October, November. I sort of wonder if that's linked to um, that we've got you know, in seasonal calving herds, we've got a lot more in-calf cows maybe in uh, in November for all our, our spring calving herds. And so maybe it's that we get more abortions around that time of year. So, so we start we start looking a bit more. Um, but anyway, the, the sort of seasonal trend is is maybe there, maybe not. It's probably too, too early to say. Um, but anyway, these are just the average results. And then um, on the next slide, Alex, please. We've got sort of the percentages of, of what that means per herd. So um, we look at here in red, that's the, the, the number of our herds across um, that, that sort of have the witch herds practices there, uh, main, main, main vets. Um, we can see that when we first started sampling, we had sort of 60 odd percent of our um, farms were salmonella positive and quarter on quarter, quarter that sort of fluctuates a little bit. Um, probably averaging about 40% somewhere there of our herds are um, bulk tank positive. Alex sort of mentioned that we, you know, some of that will be due to vaccine. Um, and, you know, if your herd's vaccinated, you're going to come up as bulk tank positive. Um, Lanks have looked in a bit more detail at um, which of your herds are vaccinating and which are not and to try and split it out a bit and I'm sure we'll talk about some of the difficulties that they've found with bought in cattle and, and stuff like that. So we've just been quite crude about it. We've looked at percentage of herds positive and percentage of herds negative and, and I think it shocked us really to have 
roughly 40% of our farms positive for salmonella, when really we, we would certainly not expect anywhere near that many to be vaccinating. Um, but yeah, um, if we look at the, the final slide, I think, please Alex. So this was just to look at um, what happened each quarter. Did, did we have a load of new positives or did we have a load of um, farms that were previously positive go, go negative? And, and there is a lot of fluctuation. Um, you've probably all seen your own reports and we do have herds that will be positive one quarter, negative the next, positive um, the next. And Alex mentioned this earlier, there's quite a low false positive rate on, on salmonella testing and that includes the bulk tanks that there's sort of no smoke without fire. You don't have to have hundreds of um, infected or, or latently infected cows to be tipped over that fine balance of are you positive or are you negative as a herd um, and um, what has happened on some of these farms is, is that we've had a, a spike, a new positive case that we maybe weren't expecting um, and it's prompted us to go and do some further testing to do some young stock testing or um, in some cases to go um, hunting maybe for some, check, to do some um, cultures on some scouring cows or to make double sure that we're investigating abortions and stuff. So I say that's where we've seen the massive benefit of including salmonella um, in our bulk tank monitoring is that we've um, gone away and, and investigated a bit more or, or sort of started looking for a disease that's, that's really costing farms but it can fly under the radar a bit. Um, I've just had a question that says, do you know the percentage of your herds that vaccinate? So um, I just did a, a sort of count up um, of, of the herds that I deal with. So there's five of my herds um, vaccinate for salmonella. Um, almost all of them had at some point or another could have been um, some have been going three, four, five years with the vaccine, um, but two of them have started in the last six months, um, both triggered by um, abortions uh, or, or pregnancy losses. So um, quite a few of them were expecting cows to calve or with the barren when we've gone, sort of done a bit of in, bit of digging, a bit of investigating, we found that um, that yes, yeah, salmonella was present on the farm and, and we've managed to get cultures to sort of confirm that as well. Um, and it's, it's triggered them to, to go, and, go and vaccinate. I, I just looked at um, sort of how many, I, we, I don't know exactly how many of our farms vaccinate, um, but I looked at how many, we probably have a year about 8,000 cows vaccinated for salmonella so you break that down into however many herds you, you want you know there's 8,000 cows um, are vaccinated so there's about 12,000 doses of vaccine go out the door a year um, I couldn't tell you if that's across all three practices or, or if that's um, just in which church but it's, it's I'd say it's becoming more and more um, common probably driven partly by the um, it's really common, really common vaccine in, in Ireland because of all the work that's been done out there. And I think um, that's maybe brought this conversation up in the minds of uh, block carbon herds. So that they, those guys, because they're sort of led by what's going on in Ireland, what's going on in New Zealand, um, they've been pretty, pretty eager to do something about to tackle some of their herds. Yeah, we've got... Um... So after we go through our data and go through the Bakewell data, we've just got a, a graph to show sort of the seasonal pattern of, of vaccination. So we we shelve that for now. And then I know we've got some of the other vets um, on the webinar, if they've got any thoughts on why it's possibly changed, um, we could potentially discuss it a bit later. Or some of the farmers, like if there's people that are vaccinating or in two minds about it, like if, if you want to be honest and say why, um, we can chat about that later. Um, 
Are we on to the Langs data now? Please, okay. Alex. Sorry, I've just got a private message, so I'm just chatting <laughs> <in there. laughs> Hang on one second. Uh, yeah. There we go. Can you see that? Yeah. Great. Yeah. So this one's probably not like the one of the best ones to um, illustrate too much, but so the cutoff is 35 for positive. So obviously this is just a very crude average of everyone. Um, all of the bulk milks that we're that we're taking in Lanks, we have excluded the farms that um, vaccinate because they do push the serology high. Um, but actually, like on the whole, if you look at the average, you think it's it's okay. But if we delve a bit deeper, if you go to sorry, the next slide, please. Sorry, Alex. trying. No, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we go. Is that the next one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the next one. Yeah. So this is. Yeah, so this is just showing that actually within that average, we've got quite a big spread of data. So the crosses you can see, that's that's the average plotted down there. But even, so these are unvaccinated herds, we're still getting um, bulk tank readings of, of pretty high, which is, it's difficult to see on here whether that's the same farm, but it is probably quite indicative of at least they've had some sort of contact with salmonella. Um, but yeah it just sort of gives you a bit of an indication so we we map ours on a graph now so you can see the trends changing over time um but like i said it's it's below that 35 we we want to be and actually it can it can spike up and down really quite dramatically is there anything you want to add on that alan uh no i just think it's it's difficult to say so obviously we've got some herds that are flying herds or buying your cow so you're never you're never sure whether they're buying in herd buying in cows that are from vaccinated herds um or herds of history of salmonella um and then that can cause their bite their bulk milk to spike cool next slide please alex so we've just um looked at the percentages of positives and negatives across the um all the quarters we sort of seem to be hovering around the 40 percent mark um and there is suggestion of a of some seasonality there um that's one of the reasons for doing this talk because now we've got a year's worth of data we can kind of look at trends and go oh yeah actually that's that probably is the seasonal pattern and up here um so it's slightly different to your one down in Whitchurch, isn't it, Rob? Yeah, we've not seen quite as um, big an increase in quarter three uh, 2020 as we maybe expected. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it's, it's pretty much this idea of um, autumn sort of being the peak exposure um, sort of fits. Um. So yeah, this is our, so looking at change from one quarter to the next, and actually in the last few quarters, we've, we've had quite a, well, quite a big rise. I mean, it's difficult to say how significant that is because we are talking small percentages, but there seems to be some sort of upward pattern. Um, I mean, we probably get a bit more fluke around here than you guys probably do down in Cheshire read that historically like that that can cause or can go hand in hand a bit with salmonella do you have any um thoughts on that alex yeah there's definitely some stuff um you know on that in the literature definitely yeah so um, like we're saying obviously salmonella vaccination can can help but we do need to think about that bigger picture um it's just sort of highlighting those those higher risk times so obviously quarter one to quarter two and then two to two to three um seem to be quite like i suppose we've got a mixture of um zero grazing farms and grazing ones so whether we've got housing where all the cows are mixing together and then you've got turnout between quarter two and quarter three so actually across the two main types um we've got two big stressors that might hit at slightly different points um but again we haven't we haven't got that much data to draw any massive accurate conclusions is there anything you, you want to add alan 
No, I think you got, got everything covered there, mate. Cool. And then I think we've I think, got... Just out of interest for me, I've got a question. Are, the, are you doing all the testing in all the different branches at the same time? Because I'm just thinking, because potentially you've got serial conversion takes up to four to six weeks. So I'm just thinking if, I don't know, are, are you doing it all the same time and could that... No it's, no, it's completely random. Like It's just okay. scattered. So it'll be the same. There'll be three months difference between each of the farms but there'll be like a block that are done in so i think quarter one covers january february march and then okay. it goes on like that but yeah. if you like if you're in january then you'll be you'll be tested again in april yeah we for, for sort of logistics and getting these reports out um so sort of pretty much as soon as they land with us we want to get them out to farmers so we've split them into like three blocks you're either a First week of the quarter, first month of the quarter, second month of the quarter, or third month of the quarter farm. So there's a bit of spread. Um, and then lastly, we just got a little bit on the Bakewell data, I think. I can't remember if I put another. Yeah. So we don't have as many farms yet, um, dairies at Bakewell, but I know we've got some um, clients on the talk today. So we just wanted to show that. Um, got some of that data doing very well for quarter three <laughs> um, and then if we look at the change it just sort of to highlight as well like if we if we haven't like we've got four or five data points um, in Langston and Whitchurch and it's great that we've that we've got this available but at the moment it's it's really difficult to draw any conclusive um, results from this but it definitely shows the potential for you guys of what, of what we can do further down the lines. Um, and then lastly, like I said, we just got one on um, vaccine sales. So just by month. So as Alex was saying, there's different times you can va vaccinate um, depending on your stresses or I suppose we have some people that, that just vaccinate pre-carving. Do you have any opinion on if anything's better or worse, Alex? Or is it just depends on the system? Yeah, I guess it, it depends on the system and why you're vaccinating in the first place, I guess, and when you started vaccinating in the first place. I'd say um, the vast majority of herds that I've, I'm asked about or, or spoken to you probably um, end up doing a pre-carving booster um, purely because of the you're going to maximise your um, you're going to maximise your reduction, if that makes sense, in shedding around carving, which is possibly the maximal time of doing that. And you're going to maximise your carb antibodies and colostrum. So I guess from two prong approach. However, historically, I know in Ireland where apparently a large amount of the vaccine goes into um, goes into herds where the predominant presenting time sign has been abortion. Can I should just clarify at this point in time, because I know I talk about vaccine and it is recorded that it hasn't got a specific anti-abortion claim. It is used in Ireland for that purpose, but that isn't a specific claim. It's for the ones that I said about sort of, you know, reducing shedding and colostral immunity and reducing environment challenge. Um, but I do know that, yeah, in certain circumstances, it is used sort of um, prior to that at risk um, abortion period. So if you are doing it kind of mid lactation, that might be the reason why. Cool. Does anybody have any questions, comments? Give you a little bit of time to type away if that's. I, I'll just say that, um, yeah, I mentioned earlier that this idea of we get, we get more diagnoses so, so it's you're more if you look at the national surveillance data when do the, the, the labs actually isolate salmonella so when what month of the year did, did they grow salmonella from um, abortion samples or muck samples and and that ties quite well with um, these vaccine sales so th they peak really strongly in um, October, November, the, the sort of number of diagnosed cases of salmonella. And that's probably, probably links in with the idea of the, the Irish boys um, going in, 
in sort of September-ish, um, they sort of go with their vaccine then, probably thinking, oh God, yeah, it's abortion season next month. Um, I want to get the vaccine in to have the most uh, chance of reducing it, even though there's no vaccine, you know, no claim on the label. Cool. Well, we've not got any more come in, but obviously if, um, if you do suddenly think of any, just let us know. We can pass them on to Alex. I've written down the ones that, um, the ones about chickens and the back to scan one, Alex, and I'll pass that yeah. on to you. Yeah, it's be worth putting our heads together. I'll see if I can get anything on my end on the back to scan. But I think we've probably, probably answered it correctly, although I haven't got any black and white evidence for it. <laughs> Cool. Well, thank you so much for um, chatting through your, your favourite topic. Um, definitely very knowledgeable. And thank you very much, Rob, for your help and to Alan as well. And obviously everybody that's here, because without you, it, it wouldn't really be a talk. It would just be us chatting about that stuff. Cheers, Becca. Thank you. All right. Bye, all. Bye, all. Bye.